Uh, hello everyone, welcome to lecture 10. Uh, today, uh, as I alluded to in lecture 9, we are going to speak about the export of Italian uh, neorealism to South America and to Africa. So we're going to be speaking about, uh, you know, the international impact this film movement had. So we're reading today from the, the course reader. Here's the article. It looks something like this. Global Cinema. And the authors are, well, it's edited by Roberto and Wilson. But the chapter that we're working on is, oh, that looks terrible. Doesn't matter. Let's see if you can see it. Chapter 9, A Poetics of Refusals, Neorealism from Italy to Africa by Rachel Gabara. So that's the article you're looking for. It's the final article in the Italians in your course reader. Um, for anybody that still doesn't have the course reader, I'll try to get you a, a, a digital version of this. But, yeah, so that's the theme for, for today's lecture, Lecture 10, the last uh, theoretical lecture on, on Italian neorealism before, in Lecture 11, we do the assignment workshop, and then 12 and 13, we move on, we do our final film movement. We do an, an abridged version of that final film movement. Right, so let's take a look. Remember, the main theme here is, as I said, that export of Italian neorealism. But the article is useful not only for that. The article is useful because it will also um, delve into an examination of Italian neorealism itself. So it's going to help you in two ways. It's going to talk a little bit more about uh, the full movement itself. And then it's going to talk about its... Uh, um, export. Right, so there's two aspects to the article. Um, all right, so let's start reading. We start reading right from the, the beginning. Uh, we are on page 187. It's the very first little uh, page in this particular chapter. So there we go. That's how it looks. Poetics of Refusals, Rachel Gabara, and then we start reading over here. So as usual, I'm going to alert you to the most important parts, and you can underline them, and we're going to take some, some notes as well as we, as we go along. Okay, so let's start reading uh, right at the beginning. Scholars have tended to write about African film as though it exists in an odd sort of isolation, only reacting against and rejecting the themes and styles of colonial and neo-colonial European cinema, rather than participating in international cinematic traditions. So that's a very first important point. Um, any cinema, including African cinema, it never stands alone. It always has a constellation of influences right and it doesn't just react to to international influences it doesn't just try to negate them or copy them it just simply takes from a constellation of sources mixes it in with its own context to make something quite unique and quite a uh, special you could say we drop three lines down from that uh, in what follows i or Gubara will ask what legacy Italian neorealism might have left African film, tracing a political and aesthetic cinematic project as taken up in different national and historical contexts. So as I said, we're talking about the export of Italian neorealism to Africa, but not only, also to South America. Uh, we drop down to the last paragraph of that page. Uh, this project, a consideration of neorealism's impact on African film, is quite literally a, a twisted one. There's little evidence 
of any direct influence of Italian cinema in Africa, whether in the form of assertions by filmmakers or illusions within their films. We will thus get from Italy to Africa, therefore, via Latin America. And we turn the page, and the concept of a revolutionary third cinema. So now we're at the top of page 188. Italian neorealism in the 40s and 50s, new Latin American cinema from the late 50s to the early 70s, and sub-Saharan or mainly West African film from its beginnings in the early 60s share the search for a radically new way to make films that would be strikingly unlike the American ones flooding their markets. So again, you want to focus on that idea of, of radical difference. That's what in lecture 9, remember, Deleuze was looking for. He was looking for a kind of a new image of cinema, somebody that was doing cinema differently. Uh, all three, we carry on, all three were based on a political and stylistic rejection of Hollywood. Filmmakers, film historians and theorists alike have characterized as realist. But th these realisms look very different and serve different ends. So every time... This is like a, a first point to make. Every time somebody would borrow from Italian neorealism, or it would manifest itself in a different context, it would of course look different because of that context, right? It wasn't just a direct transposition. As it moved from one context to another, it would augment, it would change. There would be some kind of palpable uh, a difference. Right, so you could you could trace the link between the Italians and the Latin Americans or South Americans, if you want to say, and you can trace the link between the Italians and the Africans, but that realism that is depicted is going to look different in each context. It's not going to be a carbon copy. It is going to look slightly or, or significantly different. Uh, we jump down, so we're in the middle of the page, we're in the middle of page 188. Okay, so we're right in the middle of page 188. Uh, Italian directors, including Rossellini, Vittorio de Sisa, and Lucino Visconti, accomplished a certain realism, or to use Roland Barthes' words, a reality effect, via a blurring of the traditional distinction between documentary and fictional genres, using one, or documentary, to inflect the other fiction. Right, so again, you want to write your blurred lines uh, in, in the margin. Uh, we know that this is what these guys were always getting up to. They were trying to blur the lines of reality and fiction, consciousness and unconsciousness, and so forth. Right, they were always blurring the, the lines. Uh, so there's a lovely kind of phrase you could use if you drop five lines down uh, what these guys were up to really this, this blurring of the lines was a documentarizing of fiction or if you want to say a fictionalizing of the documentary right a documentarizing of fiction or a fictionalizing of the documentary And we write at the bottom of 188 now. Italian filmmakers sought to create a realist cinema that would stand in stark contrast to the white telephone comedies and the lavish productions of the fascist period. We've spoken about that a, a lot in previous lectures. Neo-realism attempted, like earlier realisms in the Soviet Union, France and Great Britain, to represent the everyday lives of the poor jobless, Ordinary citizens who had been invisible in mainstream studio films. Cesar Zavattini, the screenwriter and filmmaking partner of De Sisa and self-appointed theorist of neorealism, asserted that the artist's tasks were that the artist's task was to excavate reality. Okay, so very interesting. And remember, I mentioned this in previous lectures. This was a very politicized form of filmmaking. By, by default, it was a very politicized form of, of filmmaking. Okay, so just like this is 
quite interesting, just like um, in class, sometimes a gang walks past screaming and shouting, so the neighbours have now walked past screaming and shouting. <laughs> okay. Uh, but now we're going to get to, to something complicated, and we're not talking about the export yet. We have to talk about this this idea or this concept of reality and excavating reality and these claims about reality. So this is the interesting thing. We're going to start talking about some of the claims made by the Italian neorealists. And remember, we've presented them in a very positive light so far, but we can also... Um, question them and we can criticize them a bit does this reality that they are showing is it really reality or is it something else is there a bit of artifice to it that's filtered through a particular ideological disposition or an ideological bias we'll take a look so uh, at the top of 190 if you drop down and you go to the top of page 190 um there's this recognition, this is the second line from the top, it says the following, it's from the theorist Bazin, or Bazin. Uh, Realism in art can only be achieved in one way, through artifice. So realism in art can only be achieved in one way, through artifice, or that which is artificial. So you really have to think about it. Uh, think, for example, if you are... Uh, watching a documentary right and you think to yourself my goodness what a truthful expose this is about uh, this particular topic but you'd have to remember that that presentation is the pro that documentary that presentation is in a sense also artificial it isn't really reality it's a representation of a particular reality so the director of the documentary, for example, every single shot is a shot that they chose, right? They've let certain shots out, for example, they've let certain shots in. Certain shots are taken from certain angles, there's certain music attached to certain uh, interviews and so forth. They're trying to set a particular kind of emotional tone and register for the piece. So even something like a documentary, which is meant to be a slice of life, is in itself an artificial construction right every shot chosen every angle chosen the music chosen what is displayed what is not displayed how it is displayed it's always going to be artificial right it's an artificial choice that's superimposed on a particular reality that is being uh, filmed right so reality in art including in cinema including in any type of film reality can only be achieved through the artificial right uh, we're going to jump about 10 lines down this really neatly captures it neorealist filmmakers try to make us think that their artifice is reality they made the artificial seem real very very important they made the artificial seem real Right, Lotman is going to capture this for us. He's going to, to kind of get to the neorealists and to, to the heart of the matter in the next passage. It's in the middle of this page, page 190. He's going to say the following. Let's take a look. So remember, we're in the middle of page 190. Neorealism was then, as has been every literary or filmic realism, a style. Very important. Circle that. A style. And in this case... A style based on what the Soviet semiotician Yuri Lotman called a poetics of refusals. Its active elements were always refusals. A refusal to use a stereotypical hero or typical film scenes. A refusal to, to use professional actors. Uh, a denial of the star system. A refusal to employ montage in an ironclad scenario. A refusal to use prepared dialogue or musical accompaniment. Such a poetics of refusals can only be effective against a remembered background of cinema art of the opposite type. Without cinematography of historical epics, 
film operas, westerns, or Hollywood stars, it loses a good deal of its artistic meaning. So this really gets to the idea, it starts to get to the idea that Italian neorealism was kind of a an oppositional type of cinema. They were fighting back, and we know this from previous lectures, they were fighting back against a particular portrayal, right? A particular way of doing art and cinema. They wanted to do it differently. They wanted to put themselves in opposition to, to that. Uh, and one of the ways that they do that, of course, is, as Luckman lists, like not using professional actors, um, not having this very kind of strict scenario. They use these different techniques to, to, to refuse films that had come before. Uh, but remember, as we learned in previous lectures, they are doing that for a, a, a reason. They're doing it for a particular reason. It is politicized. It is oppositional. Um, it is their claim that cinema has to be done in such a way, in such an oppositional, different manner to be ethical, right? And you'll have to go back to Lecture 9 uh, to work through that kind of conundrum. They have to do cinema differently to be ethical. Okay, um, let's keep reading. We move on to page 191 at the very top. Neorealist films rely on a spectatorial fami fami familiarity with the codes of documentary which has been imported into fiction. So again, so long I would say to you guys that this is the most important thing to take from this article, is that these guys are always mixing documentary and fiction. This blurring of the lines between documentary and fiction. Right, This is the main thing. That's the thing to, to, to focus on. Right, And that's the technique that you're going to try to find in the contemporary films that you analyze, that weird mix between documentary and uh, uh, fiction. We move on towards the bottom of 191, the, the final paragraph of 191. Uh, Neorealist filmmakers seeking to represent a new national reality created one. They did so by using stylistic elements, traditionally emblematic of documentary film. Rough composition, real people and locations without strictly documentary content. Despite his seeming desire to strip all that was fictional from film, Sabatini was not interested in making documentary films, but documentary-like fictions. Okay, very, very important. Documentary-like fictions. A mixture between those two. Neorealism documentarized fiction to tell stories that seemed real, producing authentic illusions and the illusions of authenticity. So it's this wonderful in-between space, this wonderful liminal space that Italian neorealism inhabited. The space that kind of blurs lines. And that's what they were always, always up to. And then you can see why I said in Lecture 9 as well that this appealed so much to guys like the post-structural philosophers, right? It was something that, that was being born that operated outside of conventional codes of cinema or art. Okay, so we leave it there. This will be the first section of Lecture 10. Uh, where we just talked about that, that blurring of the lines, we talked about this idea of, of an illusion of authenticity that these guys are aiming at, and the rest of the article is then going to speak about the, the export. So first we'll be speaking about Latin America in part B of Lecture 10, and in part C of Lecture 10 we'll be talking about uh, Africa.